these events. So we have some of the best minds in the world gathered here, um, including uh, the great um, blessing uh, of uh, Dr. Bill Bomber, who is our co-chair in Sacramento. He has finally freed up enough time uh, with his intensive work with the American College of Cardiology, where he's still on their uh, governing board, uh, their executive team, uh, former president of the California chapter. He is a practicing cardiology here at the University of California, Davis, and uh, has trained many of the cardiologists in our state. Uh, so we are very fortunate to have him with us, and he has a special announcement that he wants to share with us uh, today before we, we're going to hear from Dr. Bill Bomber. We're going to put him before Betsy Thompson to free up a little bit more time for our other <coughs> fantastic speakers today. Thank you for being here. Well, we want to thank everyone for coming today. I hope you can hear me uh, from here. <laughs> um, the format, as you can see, this is not the Golden Globes, okay? We do not have audio until actually Betsy comes online, because we had to reserve that audio for her phone line, and we can't cut her off, because then we'll lose it. Thank you for coming out today. <clears throat> We appreciate your participation in this program, especially on a day like today when not many people are coming out because of the, uh, of the weather. So we have the river right behind us. We have somebody in the back who's monitoring that. It gets too high. Uh, we've rented kayaks for you to uh, leave here. So <clears throat> we hope that uh, everyone will be able to make it. Um, we're here for actually a little bit of a special announcement which I'm going to make related to one of the applications that uh, Right Care Initiative has pursued over the last six months. So if we look at the first slide <coughs> here, we're going to talk about the issue of preventive he health care in Sacramento specifically, but this applies to all areas. And uh, if we look on the left, obviously primary prevention is important for every one of us here today. So you should be aware of your family history, of the risk factors that you have. And for very high risk individuals, we might even advise things beyond the standard, the standard being lifestyle. So it's a reasonable diet. And we can, we've gone over that and had presentations on reasonable diet for preventing cardiovascular disease. It also includes exercise. So hopefully running through the rain today, you'll get 20 to 30 minutes of exercise on average so that you continue to reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. Now that being the case, we've looked at risk factors. We can predict who is high risk, who we should treat, but we occasionally miss individuals. And we miss individuals who are 20 to 65 years of age, you don't really qualify on the standard algorithms for high risk that we would start medical therapy in those individuals. That puts us to the intermediate slide, or the center here, which is how can we detect subclinical disease beyond the standard risk factor predictions for that? And we have a variety of ways that involve typically imaging. So imaging is going to tell us a little more than risk factors. Risk factors tell us who might get disease, but we don't know if you have it or not. But when you go to imaging, we actually tell you you have early subclinical disease. It's present in you, and that raises the ante and the need for per, per, perhaps getting more aggressive therapy beyond our standard lifestyle and exercise program for that. So this typical advanced uh, imaging can involve CT calcium, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, 
as well as some other things like doing ultrasound, OCT, MRI, all of those are available and they tell us whether there is actually disease, early disease present in you. We call it subclinical because you haven't had a heart attack or stroke, but we know there is plaque and things that could cause those already in your arteriovascular system for that. <clears throat> Lastly, to the right is secondary prevention after you've had your heart attack and stroke, but today we're focusing more on the subclinical disease <clears throat> in looking uh, at that. And uh, in those individuals, we're looking at, I went to the next slide, and it went to zero, so uh, there we go. <laughs> so we're looking at what CT coronary calcium could tell us beyond our traditional risk factors. So I don't have a pointer here, but we're going to focus first on the top scale. <laughs> The top scale looks at the mortality per thousand individuals uh, with <laughs> cardiovascular disease. And if you look all the way to the left on the top, there's a age group of 45 to 54. If you have ca coronary calcium from 0 to 1 to 100, it goes up progressively. And what you see there, let me see if this one here it will point. So you see that even for a young person, 45 to 54, increasing coronary calcium shown on this scale on the right increases your risk of events, especially in the group that is 55 to 64 years of age. Notice that there is a significant increase as your coronary calcium score goes up. And as you get into the older ages, coronary calcium being in red here conveys a relatively high mortality based on your age across them, each of these age groups. For every age group, coronary calcium seems to add something to just the age risk predicted for your group. And on the bottom slide, what we see here is individuals who have zero risk factors for heart disease, meaning high cholesterol, hypertension, obesity, etc., versus individuals who have three or more risk factors. And of course, as your risk factors go up, somehow that went off again. <laughs> is that, is there a timer on this? There we go. Uh, and so as you go across here with increasing risk factors, your risk for mortality from cardiovascular disease goes up. But notice, going <laughs> across here, the coronary calcium still adds a lot. In fact, there's a factor of three to five-fold increase, no matter how many risk factors you have, based on your coronary calcium risk score. And let's look at individuals where we're predicting coronary calcium to be helpful. Not in the person who already has a heart attack or stroke. They're high risk. We're going to treat them anyways. Not for the individual who we can tell from traditional risk factors is really high risk, they should be treated. But let's take an individual who has no risk factors, zero or one risk factors. <clears throat> Their risk without low coronary calcium is very, very low. But if in fact they have coronary calcium already with no risk factors, you can see that predicts a tenfold increase in their risk of event. And the height of this bar is almost as high, or almost half the height, of those who are multiple risk factors in coronary calcium. So coronary calcium in a low risk individual or intermediate individual can add additive value of predicting them to be high risk. We know that. Females who are 35 to 50 years of age, half of those females who have heart attacks don't have significant risk factors. Could this be a way of predicting in those individuals? It adds an option in these low and intermediate individuals. And the reason we're presenting it today is six months ago, the Right Care Initiative said, well, this could be in our algorithm for moderate risk individuals and be helpful, but unfortunately it is not reimbursed by CMS. It is not reimbursed by any insurance company that we can determine. 
and it was not easily available in the capital area of Sacramento. So we determined to sit down and say, can we make this test in the group that would benefit from it available for access in Sacramento? And we worked with a couple of, of programs. Stanford does offer that now as a cash price at $150. And now for the first time in Sacramento, UC Davis will offer that price, cash price of $150 for anyone who wants a CT coronary calcium. Now we've got more work to do, but the hard part is over. Do you know how hard it is to convince a hospital to offer a, a procedure at less than their cost? Their costs are higher, they're taking a hit on this, and they're, in fact, sucking up a loss on offering this at $150 uh, cash. The hard part is over. We've gotten a, several institutions in Northern California, Stanford, and UC Davis to offer this procedure at the low cost. That is hard to negotiate in the healthcare field, but it's available. We'll be making <coughs> uh, text available for both patients and referring physicians what information, what candidates for this would be especially helpful. And after the results of the test are available to the patient who gets it, what that means as far as treatment modalities, as far as risk, and as far as ways of reducing the risk at that point in time. So that's the important notice that we have. We want to thank everyone involved with that, including the Right Care Initiative, but especially the people who are here today. Your momentum, your enthusiasm was used in the negotiations to get this below cost test available in Sacramento. Thank you for attending today. Your participation means a lot for improving access to health care in the Sacramento area. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the rest of the program. <laughs> and our next speaker on the phone is related to, has to do it because of the flu. We've made an announcement today not to shake hands, the usual cordial introduction today, because of the fact that flu is in California. We know that the mortality from flu in California for young people under 65 is already approximately 10 times higher than last year. In California, we've had 37 deaths of young people under 65 years of age in flu in, Sa in California this year, and the hospitals in Sacramento are packed with patients with influenza at this time. So be careful of that, wash your hands, and we'll do that. To introduce our next speaker, <coughs> Betsy Thompson, who has been a co-chair here, uh, of the Right Care Initiative, captain in the U.S. Public Health Service, deputy regional <coughs> health administrator for the Department of Health and Human Services, has taken a new job and a new assignment, and she is now representing the CDC and will be representing and trying to represent the reduction in cardiovascular disease for the Center for Disease Control. I'd like to introduce, over the phone, now with the flu, Betsy Thompson. Hi there. Can, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't be there for what would have been my last meeting with you all on a, a semi-regular basis, but you, you definitely don't want me in the room, and I won't be able to talk very long because I will start coughing if I do. Um, however, I did, I did appreciate having just a few minutes to share with you um, kind of what my next steps are and to hopefully leave you with, with some, uh, I, I don't want to say inspiration because you all are the ones that are inspirational, but with continued motivation to keep up the good work. Um, as was just said, I, I'm actually still in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health wearing multiple hats right now. But Friday is my last day here in the San Francisco office. And then I'm transitioning back to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where I actually started my public health career, oh, 
way too many years ago, 26 or so years ago, 27. Um, and I'll be the division director for heart disease and stroke prevention. So it's an area that, of course, is very germane to all the work that you all do. And is also the home for the Million Hearts campaign, as well as Wise Woman um, and the Coverdale Stroke Registry in the funding for all of the state health departments in terms of heart disease and stroke prevention. So I'm really excited to be going back to CDC, but more specifically to work in an area um, that has such great need. As, as some of you know a little bit about my work, many of you don't, you have no reason to, but you know, on a typical day in my current office, I will work on HIV AIDS in the morning, hepatitis in the afternoon, family planning over lunch, and minority health and women's health, you know, we are, it is very, very wide, the purview. And it's going to be quite a treat to focus in on heart disease and stroke prevention. And so I'm looking forward to that challenge. I hope it will make our paths cross again. Um, and that I, this won't be the last time that I speak with you, though it will be the last time I join you on, like I say, a semi-regular basis at your, at your monthly meetings. Um, all I can say is keep up the good work and keep leading the nation, um, you know, to do better and better things. Because if, uh, and, and, and all of us in California kind of know we we are counted on to, to uh, set the bar high often and keep people on their toes to keep uh, achieving more and more. So all we will appreciate the work that you've done and. I'm going to stop there because I can feel the cough coming, and I also just want to, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take it, but I know it's a little awkward uh, on the phone. Thank you. Betsy, we're going to miss you. Thank you so much for your awesome leadership of the Capital Region uh, Right Care Initiative these past few years, and we're looking forward to collaborating with you and your new uh, role at CDC. Very exciting. Hope to have you with us at our summit on Thursday, April 5th, if you can squeeze that in. And certainly we welcome you every time you're back in California to join our Capital Region and Los Angeles University of Best Practices. I'm sorry you're not here to meet our other fabulous speakers with us, uh, Dr. John Overitveit from Sweden's Karolinska Institute and Dr. Uh, Chloe Bird from RAND, who will be talking about women's health issues. And I will, I will make it a point to introduce you all in person when you um, are recovered and uh, back in California. So good luck with your new journey, and, um, and uh, hopefully the chicken soup will help you to recover before you have to travel east. Thank you. Thanks, Betsy. We'll miss you. Take care. Thank you very much, Betsy, and good luck on your new transition. Uh, I have the privilege today uh, on this overcast day of, uh, of really brightening up your afternoon, hopefully. And that is because <clears throat> we are pleased to have a speaker, our next speaker, John Overbite, who is the Director of Research and Professor of Health Innovation, Implementation, and Evaluation at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And he is the director of this program. And John's work has been based on the belief that organization and management can bring out the best as well as the worst in clinicians and care. And the right implementation and organization design is critical for effective healthcare. He's received numerous awards, and <clears throat> we are glad to have him travel the long trip to Sacramento today. We're <coughs> proud to have John and as a participant in our Right Care Initiative uh, access. And I just want to add to that that uh, Dr. Overit Fight's uh, publications have been translated into seven languages. He's uh, a very highly published author, including, I, 
I don't have the number of books right in front of me. I think it's nine and uh, over 400 articles, uh, peer review articles. So um, we are very uh, fortunate to have him visiting the United States and visiting the right care initiative. He is, in fact, one of our members of our technical expert group of the, the super brainiacs around uh, the country who are helping us with this and the world. Yeah. Thank you, John, for being here. <coughs> so thank you very much. In Sweden, the Lutheran religion is still quite strong culturally. So this is cringe-making for me when we have all these, um, uh, because there is also a thing called Yapur, which you should never imagine you're better than anyone else. I'm sorry to hear you, I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you very much for that introduction. <laughs> um, and uh, no doubt you will blame this weather on me. I brought the weather with me. Uh, my excuse is, if I did, it would be snow because we're deep in snow at the moment. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to give you a, a different kind of presentation. A lot of this is about the big picture and about how this program can begin to build a cooperative and data-based approach to some of the challenges that your country is facing at the moment. Um, and I'll also be drawing on a lot of the work that I do in implementation science about enabling both practitioners and patients to take up new, better ways. And what we know from behavioral sciences, but also knowledge about the context in which we live our lives and how profoundly important both the social context and the environmental context are to our health and to our behaviors. Um, the tricky bit of this is, yes, so what's the effect of intervention for those? And that's where there are challenges. So it's along those two sorts of themes, implementation and the social environment um, <clears throat> and social determinants of health that, that I'll, I'll be talking. Um, Hattie, I need you to manage me ruthlessly because I want to make sure there is time for our next speaker because I, I was just talking to her and she's got some very important things. So please count me down and say, you know, don't, don't stand in front of her. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> uh, what I'm planning to do is to talk about the big picture and also to think about how, how we can build on the, this initiative to scale up some of the clinical best practices but also start thinking about how we might extend our interventions into the social areas. And one way into that is about how we enable patients to better adhere to uh, medications, but also lifestyle that, that are important. So I'm going to make a, make a pitch for that. But then I'm going to go beyond that into some of the people who are most in need that you may not even know about or reach. And to be just raising questions about if we might be more impactful if um, we went beyond the individual approach. I know this may not be appropriate or popular in this group, but someone's going to say it. Um, my excuse is I won't see anyone again. Yes, <laughs> I can, I can put, put these points. Um, so I'm going to raise some of the choices and opportunities to develop and extend what we do um, and raise some questions uh, to you on, on these subjects. Um, so the challenges. First of all, here's, here's, here's one. 1990, um, most US states were registering on, the, I think this is the CDC uh, database, 40% of people over one, that's BMI equal or over 30 or 30 pounds overweight. 20 years later, every state is over 20%, have over, over 20, and a quarter are over 30%. Um, <clears throat> and related to this is an increased understanding of what are called obesogenic, obesogenic environment which is the social context of the lives that we lead. 
in <clears throat> I think I read somewhere that in in the U.S. you are never more than I think in a, in a U.S. city you are never more than ten yards from a coke machine and a class, uh, a snack machine. It is very uh, I'm very pleased about it actually, <laughs> but I'm very aware when I'm in the states there is always lots of food available and the temptations are tremendous and also it's more difficult to do exercise um, and there also isn't so much of a culture and that's related to this point about um, don't blame it on individuals when you put someone in that situation this is what you see is the system and the environment is perfectly designed to get the results that you see and I think this is easily explainable from the social perspective. The question is then, what are the interventions? Um, yes, you can do, um, I forgot how you say this word, theatric surgery, and that is fairly effective. Um, but also very effective is weight watchers, and an important part of that is the peer pressure and the social side of um, so there are effective interventions, but these are fairly weak interventions when people exist and live in the U.S. environment. It's, it's very challenging that one. Um, so <clears throat> this may be related to this uh, graphic. What this shows is a number of countries fairly similar life expectancies around. 74, 75. Um, <clears throat> but what we see up, up here is that a lot, many of the Nordic countries um, have, uh, there's an increasing gap in life expectancy uh, um, that um, of five years longer, I think that's in 2005, and it's increased to six years. So if I was come to come to live in this country, I would have a number of years left to live, um, according to this, although I know it doesn't quite work. Now, is that because in the Nordic countries we have a single payer, single provider healthcare in the main? No, because you all know this, or versions of this graphic, um, where the uh, determinants of health make I, I do have to say it, I used to work in public health and I, I do think determinants of health is perhaps imputing a bit more causality than is justified. I'd rather put influences on in health. And these people put these the those influences in, in different bundles or groups. But generally it's it's not the healthcare up to a certain point. Um, healthcare makes a big difference, but beyond there, that doesn't make so much difference to life expectancy. Um, and we can, you can well argue that debate. Uh, what's really important is people's habits, our habits, what, whether we have a habit of regularly exercising, um, and our eating habits, and habits of sleeping and stress. The social circumstances are, have a big connection with behavioural. Um, many of our social circumstances, by that it's income, where you live, housing, uh, a number of things are bundled under that heading. And genetic predisposition does have a proportion. But what these, these kind of models miss out is the critical interaction between these things. Um, and we know very little about how these interactions operate. Um, ge genetics is not um, predetermined destiny. They are strongly, strongly modified by behavioural and social. And, and even over a few generations, you can actually have changes to genes that are influenced by social and behavioural. So um, the question then is, um, university best practices, we are focusing on this particular area and I think it's right to do so because we've got good evidence and it's doable and achievable. What I want to do is to mention <coughs> and discuss and raise issues about these others and to ask questions if we could be more impactful in terms of 
<clears throat> the ultimate goal, which I, I would argue, zero preventable heart attacks for 